Hey everybody, it's Jay, and I have in front of me my Walther PPQ in 9mm, of course. This is easily my favorite 9mm uh, handgun. Um, it fits my hand like a glove. A lot of people, I remember on the internet when these first came out, a lot of people made fun of this sort of melted crayon grip. But the designers knew what they were doing because me, for me and for I know a lot of people who've shot this or have one of these, it really fits my hand quite well. I would even go so far as to say it fits my hand perfectly. And fitment in the hand is very important with a handgun. Now, it has a really nice trigger with a short reset, but very crisp, very light. This take up with a brick with a wall and then a break short reset. Decent aftermarket support and this is one of the Gen 1 types and it even has this paddle mag release which I've come to really like. So pretty much my favorite 9mm handgun. I have one of these. I've never really felt the need to own any more. Wouldn't mind getting a Q5 match or something one day but I've got one and that pretty much does it for me. Also in front of me is my Glock Gen 7, sorry, G17 Gen 4. Now, this one has the finger grooves, and before they introduced the finger grooves, really, Glocks never really fit me that well. But with the interchangeable back straps, the finger grooves, the G17 also fits me pretty well. And this is a go-to gun for me. I actually went and shot my CHL Concealed Handgun License qualifications with this gun because I'm so accurate with it. And part of that has to do with the fitment. Part of that has to do with the trigger, which is m definitely a lot mushier than the PPQ, but is pretty consistent. And that single and safe action striker fire really works well for me. I have one Glock. I have many guns that take Glock magazines but I have one Glock. This is it. Uh, this video is not about this gun. Now let's take a look at my Beretta 92S. This is the first 92 that I ever purchased for myself. And I knew I wanted a 92 well before I bought this. But the problem, the thing that really stopped me from ever really getting one is really the fitment. The grip frame is just a little bit too big for me and doesn't fit my hand as well as either of the other two guns that I mentioned. They've always felt just a little bit on the chunky side. In addition to that, the trigger, while really good for a double action, single action trigger, is got a lot of take up and I've always found with double action guns I've, I've had a really hard time hitting anything. So, what we have here in front of me is effectively, which this isn't a crit criticism of the gun at all, but it's purely personal taste, preference, training, and fitment, a gun that doesn't especially fit me that well, whose trigger I find a little bit difficult to deal with. This video is on not only this gun, but also this gun and this gun. Also this gun. And you know what? Let's go ahead and throw this one in there as well. Yeah, for completeness sake, we'll throw this one in there. And this really is going to be a story of accidental gun collecting. So let's start with the first gun in the collection that I brought up earlier. So I knew pretty much from the first time that I shot in 92, which was Misha's M9, that I really wanted to get one. And the reason that I did is because the slides and the action, the operation, the trigger, and the overall feel are really smooth and really high quality. They just don't quite feel like anything else. Really, even for as smooth as the PPQ is, it still just doesn't quite feel quite as smooth as the Beretta 92s that I've handled. 
and I kind of kicked around the idea of getting one for a long time. There was an M9 A1 at one, a local shop that I handled a bunch of times, and they were going for about 600 bucks. So I was looking at getting one of the knockoffs, one of the many 92 knockoffs that are out there, and just happened to run across a flyer for the 92S, this one here, that with hand select from wherever we bought them from, was about $320, which was a little bit less than what the clones were going for. So I thought, well, for that kind of money, I might as well get an original Beretta. Plus the 92S was relatively limited production. And I'm really happy that I did because the 92S is purportedly, these were Italian police trade-in. And mine has pretty limited wear on the metal bits. The grip panels are pretty shoot up. Someone carved an S. I assume, since it's an S and these are Italian, that that S, S stands for Smario. The bluing on it is really quite attractive. Hopefully you can see it in the camera here. It's kind of turned to a purple color. And it's really just about mirror polished. The sights are black on black. Again, hopefully you can see this in the camera. The camera is focusing properly. So not necessarily the easiest to pick up on and shoot. And on the 92S further, it has one of these heel mounted, bottom mounted, kind of unconventional in today's era, mag releases. So it was for those reasons that the sights the, uh, the mag release that really realistically this should have done it for me on 92 I got a 92 knocked out I'm good but I was still eyeing a new production 92 or M9 to get the more modern features plus with them be being the standard issue of the US military um, it still felt like I had a hole in my collection well I didn't necessarily want to drop another, you know, roughly $600 to get a new M9 or 92, but at the local shop, I happened to see this rather odd duck on the shelf for under 400 bucks. Uh, it was a used gun, but it looked like it had never been fired. For all intents and purposes, I'm certain with this being Ducks Unlimited, it had wooden panels on it originally. I replaced it with these polymer ones. That, for all intents and purposes, it was probably a drawing gun. The person who was selling it or traded it in probably didn't have much in it. So the store didn't have much in it. So they let it go for really cheap. In fact, it was only about 50 bucks more than I spent on the 92S. So it seemed like a no-brainer to upgrade and have a good modern production 92. Again, very smooth, a little bit of mush, almost imperceptible in the single action trigger, and the double action itself is also quite smooth. With the falling block mechanism that is sort of endemic to the Breda 92 design, you can see here, the recoil is quite negligible on these. And in addition to being really smooth and of extremely high quality fit and finish, they're also just a joy to shoot. And so I have become a Beretta fan, Beretta 92 fan over the course of securing these two guns. And that's about the worst thing that can happen when you're not really intending to have a collection is that you fall in love with that gun and you feel like you have to have more. Well, fast forward a little bit. Sort of still me not knowing that I was going to end up with a Beretta collection. I got that MP40P pistol made by ATI in 9mm. It's a reproduction, modern reproduction of the MP40. And felt like I needed to have a sidearm to kind of go along with it. 
So I put the uh, the bug in Misha's ear that I was looking for a P38. And literally, on my way home, a few hours later, I was driving home, and Misha called me and said, you have to go check out AIM Surplus. They just put some cheap uh, P38 marked P1s. They had came with the original box, were, as you can see with this one, in pretty good shape, and also were extremely affordable. So that fit the bill, bill quite well. Now, much like the 92, and the reason why I have this on the table, is it has the open slide, and it also has a barrel block, which the Walther P38 is pretty much the predecessor to the 92 style barrel block. So, I had a fairly early 92 with the 92S. I had sort of the next iteration with a 92FS. And then I had one of its somewhat distant predecessors in a P38. So I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. The next purchase was the 1951, which again is one that I learned learned about because it came through on a flyer. Very clearly a descendant of the 92. You can very much see the stylings here with a little bit of the P38. You can see how similar they were. Now, the 1951 preceded the 92. I believe there is at least one other gun in the series. I'm wanting to say a Model 70 in there as well. But the 1951 preceded the 92. And it's a little bit different. It also has, much like the 92S, the very low magazine release. But unlike any of the other 92s, it has a single action trigger, single action only. And so when this came through, again, a really good surplus buy. And if they're still out there and available, um, getting a little harder to find in decent shape from what I've seen. Seems like they were used pretty hard, but they were also made in pretty limited numbers. It's a really fun gun to shoot. Also, as you can see, has the barrel block in it, like the 92s, like the P38, the P1. But again, you can see the direct line between it and the 92 and 92S when you compare them side by side. So I felt like my collection was pretty complete at that time and was satisfied, pretty much ready to roll on, get on to some other things when I was listening to a podcast about movies and they were talking about the Matrix series and in the thumbnail of that podcast is Trinity holding what I thought at a glance was a 92. But what it turns out was it was a Model 81. Now I'm not sure, I don't quite remember if it was an 82 or an 83, but it definitely wasn't a 92. It was one of the compact versions of the 92. In this case, I have a Beretta Model 81. This is in 32 ACP. And you can see this is an early 81. These came in on Italian penal system surplus. And you can see with this being an early 81, that the 92S and this 81, manufactured very closely around the same time, this is pretty much just a miniaturized 92 with a, of course, with a Browning mag release. It is double stack, 32 ACP. It's very accurate for a 32, and with it being in 32, it almost seems, like I mentioned in my review, almost overbuilt. It's, um, really really light recoiling for that caliber very decent trigger pretty much typical beretta very smooth very controllable doesn't have a falling block doesn't have a barrel block like the um like the 92s but yeah pretty much just a, a shrunk down version now what they said or what i've read you can see the lock here and not here they used an 81 or one of its uh, derivatives 
in the Matrix series because the 92 just looked so huge in Carrie and Moss's uh, hands. I don't know if that's true or not. It's just what I've read. But, uh, but yeah, there you go. So pretty much learned of the existence of basically a miniature 92 in a caliber I really enjoy shooting and uh, had to go out and get one. Again, these were really hot surplus buys at the time, around 250 bucks, and in really good, generally really good shape. So if they're still out and around when this video goes up, um, I recommend going and checking one out. Now, you heard me complain earlier about the, the size of the grip on the 92, about it being just a little bit too big for my hands. And I saw a video from Military Arms Channel on the M9A3, which uses Beretta's new Vertec grip, which is definitely a different angle. You can see how straight it is. It doesn't curve out, it's just very straight, but is also much slimmer. And I knew I had to get my hands on one because my primary complaint about the 92 is that it just doesn't fit my hand very well. And I'm very pleased to say that the M9A3 fits my hand pretty much perfectly. It's not the most ergonomic grip for me, but it fits a lot better than any other 92. So I finally, after all this time, finally have a 92 that fits. This being, of course, an M9A3. Same hallmarks as the other 92s. Incredibly buttery smooth action. Quite good trigger. In action, very light. A little bit of a long reset makes follow-up shots a little more deliberate and challenging with a really nice double action trigger. Not this performance center, but not bad. You can see some of that take up disappears whenever it's in single action. So this one finally alleviated the grip problem. Now the trigger problem is not something that can go away with a design change unless they went to a single action trigger. And that is entirely on me. It really wasn't until I went and shot, this was some years back, went and shot a bunch of revolvers with a friend who was a big revolver guy and had some some pretty unique and neat examples that he taught me how to shoot a double action revolver. And that was completely transformative for my ability to shoot double action semi-autos. The first double action semi-auto that I ever had was a SIG P220 in 45, and I remember taking it to the range and I could barely hit on paper at seven yards. And so I went ahead and rented a 1911 and shot it side by side. It was a Springfield 1911 loaded, and I was hitting within two inches of right where, I, you know, point of aim. And I legitimately thought my P220 was broken. And I actually ended up selling it off. This was very early on in my gun buying career, and I didn't know a lot about, you know, really what I was doing. So it wasn't until later when my friend shot, told me how to shoot, didn't shot me how to shoot, told me how to shoot double action revolvers, basically making sure that my finger pad was even with the trigger and that the barrel was pretty well lined up with my arm that my accuracy dramatically improved. So that's entirely a training thing. And while I generally prefer a safe action or single action trigger, I am absolutely 100% able to shoot accurately now with the double action in the Beretta, which is great because I love shooting these guns. So I have some other accidental collections I'll probably do videos on in the future, but I thought that would be a good start and a good primer. If you have any other accidental collections, tell us about them in the comments. And if you're interested in helping support us, check out the link to our Patreon page. This is Jay, and I will see you again soon next time.